superior coverage. Simply. Well, it's a rainy, wet night. Good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from News Hub at Adesawe, Kanda, also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Tonight, the impact of Ghana's energy sector wars on livelihoods could be more dire than you can imagine. Because even the World Bank has taken notice of the devastation of Dumso and it is causing businesses and social lives in Ghana. We have a conversation and we're asking you what your Dumso situation is tonight. And we already got notice a number of areas are off because of the rains, heavy rains earlier today, uh, leading into most parts of the night. So stay with us. We have the conversation. The Ghana city continues to crumble. With no end in sight, that's a question we're asking. Putting a strain on businesses and individuals alike. We ask what can be done to rescue the city from its continuous depreciation. We have a conversation. Professor Peter Corte was our guest together with Mark Bidwabwaji with the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We have a conversation tonight. The Speaker of Parliament has been petitioned to institute a bipartisan probe into what anti-corruption crusaders say are the inactions of the Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko, and the Attorney General's Department in the Cecilia Dapa stolen cash saga. One of the petitioners is former Auditor General Daniel Yao Demelevo. He is our guest tonight. Daniel Demelevo speaks to us here on Ghana tonight on this matter. As always, you're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and X. Let's get talking. Oh, it's been raining for most part of the evening and want to hear from you. A number of you are still caught up in... Um, the traffic as we speak the deadlock in some places especially areas like um la leading to teshi and Nungwa. we're monitoring that as well and those of you heading towards the white west hills area as well we're heading towards that place as well but let's hear from you um and, and share your thoughts with us the hashtag we're using is gonna tonight on facebook and x we're asking a number of questions that share your situation with us where you are and then also what's happening with the doom so let's hear from you as well on that one so let's get talking tonight. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. Jurors have declared a strike, forcing high-profile cases like the murder trial of former Ebuakwa North MP J.B. Dankwai Edu, Kaswatin Killers, and Gregory Afuko to be postponed. They insist that the continuous delay in the payment of their 10-month allowance will result in their indefinite absence from the court premises. The World Bank has warned that Ghanaian businesses may collapse if the government increases tariffs to address financial issues in the power sector. This caution comes at a time when citizens continue to grapple with power outages. It hasn't been easy, but we are coping. And even the day that our president said he has fixed the, the doom, so we slept in the darkness. As for the consistency, maybe for a month now, we've been experiencing such doom so activities. I'm a student ready to write my WASI examination, and I prepare sometimes in the night, but since the light of... You know, we don't get the chance to study at night to prepare. So. It can go off around 7, then they'll bring it maybe the next day, even. And it's very bad. The Opposition National Democratic Congress is calling for a non-partisan parliamentary probe into the missing biometric verification registration devices, a move it believes will enhance transparency ahead of the December 7 polls. Addressing a news conference in Accra, the party urged Ghanaians to monitor the activities of the Electoral Commission to ensure free, fair and transparent elections. The EC might be testing the waters with their rigging strategy by deliberately misrepresenting and miscalculating registration figures. 
Our prompt detection and exposure of these egregious errors should serve as a clear warning to the EC about the vigilance of the NDC. We are fully prepared to safeguard the sanctity of the coming elections. We expect the EC to now firmly renounce any intention, if it exists, to collude with the failed NPP government to rig the election. John Mahama's running mate in December polls, Professor Jean Nana Upokwajimai, has described clashes at some centers in the ongoing limited voter registration in the Ashanti region as discomforting. I've heard of fights, I've heard of um, violence, I've heard of machines that have not worked the entire day into the second and third day. I've heard of things that raise the tension in the country. And my hope is that going forward, that's not going to happen. Five environmental organizations have served notice to sue government over reclassification of some of Ghana's forest reserves to allow for mining and timber lumbering. Spokesperson of the group, Daryl Bosu, emphasized the urgent need for immediate action to prevent the degradation of globally significant biodiversity areas. Government has started giving out administrative instructions to the Forestry Commission to start opening up protected forests, which we call the globally significant biodiversity areas for logging activities, and this we think are uh, illegal and needs to be done the right way. I mean, there, some of these forest reserves are set up for the purpose of providing us with um, ecosystem services like water supply, good air to breathe, and also biodiversity, which is very crucial for pollination and for food security issues. So before you take such action, you really need to ensure that you follow due process. Uh, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, the Speaker of Parliament has been petitioned to institute a bipartisan probe into what anti-corruption crusaders say. Uh, the inactions of the Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko, and the Attorney General in the Sicilia Dapa stolen cash saga. Now, one of the petitioners is former Auditor General Daniel Yao de Malavo on this matter. And there's fundamental questions that they are asking of uh, the Ioko and then also uh, right now, Parliament is that, look, beyond what Ioko has done and the advisory to, by the Attorney General to Ioko and what the Special Prosecutor has done in this is the other part case, we want Parliament to step in. He's not alone in this. In fact, over 100 Ghanaian citizens, they are the ones who are demanding Parliament constitutes a bipartisan probe into the conduct of the Economic and Organized Crime Office following what they say is a failure by the state agency to probe the Cecilia Dapa cash saga. You know, this back and forth and what we've seen over the period, at some point, Yoko going at it with the special prosecutor's office in public and going back and forth, and some thought that it was a diversionary tactic to actually take our attention off the real issue, establishing the source of the money found in Cicely Adapa's home. The petitioners include Daniel Yard de Melovo, who's going to be joining us shortly, former Auditor General, legal practitioner, uh, Martin Pebble, and political science professor at the University of Ghana, Legon, Professor Ransford Jampo, they are arguing that the inability of Yoko to probe this matter, the Cecilia Dapa matter, cannot be countenanced, hence a demand for a thorough probe. Now, I'm going to show you excerpts of this petition that they have now sent to Parliament, asking that the Speaker constitutes a bipartisan problem to this particular matter. Take a look at this. These are the issues that they are demanding. First off, that we, the un underlying being citizens of Ghana and interested in promoting and sustaining Ghana's democracy and the fight against corruption, which has retarded Ghana's progress for decades, wish to petition your office, your high office, for a probe on the above matter. The above matter, in this case, is the Adapa Kash Saga. 
Now, it is the situation that Ioko, led by his executive secretary, Mami Atiwa Dodankwa, has chosen not to investigate the allegations of money laundering against Isida Dapa. And we do know this. And this is as a result of that advisory from the Attorney General. Says, you know what, Ioko, don't waste your time on investigating this money laundering issue. Ioko claimed that they cannot comprehend the basis of the OSP's opinion that Madame Dapa, former Minister for Sanitation Water Resources, and her husband were potentially involved in money laundering regarding the substantial sums of cash discovered in their residence and in various bank accounts. It is evident and clear that with ample evidence available, accompanied by a docket that contains over 20 witness statements, it is highly doubtful that Yoko cannot comprehend the details of the docket. Another salient fact that should help is the Yoko statement that they released, asserting that Yoko had returned the docket to the OSP on 3rd May 2023. That's, just, that's the 3rd of May 2024. It has to be. Now, however, a few days later, when Madame Adodankwa was interviewed on the matter, she, among others, stated that she was about to send the docket to the OSP, meaning the press release was false. This is another fact that calls for a probe because it suggests a deliberate attempt to cover up the crime that has been committed in this case. They continue that it's also instructive that on Saturday, 4th May 2024, the Attorney General stated on radio, specifically Joy FM, that Ioko had finished its investigations into the matter, which directly contradicts a statement in the Attorney General's representative's letter to Ioko that investigations was yet to commence. So these are all the contradictions and some of the references that these over a hundred citizens of this republic are pointing to, reason why they want parliament to step into it. Now, Daniel Yao Demelevo, is former Auditor General of the Republic of Duke, Ghana. Um, he's connecting with us outside of the country. Thank you so much for joining us here, Daniel Yard de Melovo, here on Ghana tonight. First of all, these are just pointers to some of the demands that you're making, but what exactly do you want beyond this parliament to do with this probe? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Let's me say that these are all avenues available for us to seek redress. So you can go to court, you can go to Yoko, you can go to Parliament. And it is my considered view that Parliament has this oversight responsibility over the state institutions. So that is why we have asked Parliament to look into the case and tell us what exactly is the reason behind the apparent refusal of Yoko to investigate uh, the allegation or the offense because uh, we want to know the story behind the story uh, mm -hmm. of Yoko. If you say you want to know the story behind the story, is that to say that Yoko's story, that they, they looked into it and based on the Attorney General's advisory, they are not going to waste their time on investigating Cecilia Dapa on this money laundering because in their view, to the extent that the OSP did not give them the, the details of their own investigation, they, they cannot proceed. That story, you say, cannot be believed? It is not true, it cannot be believed? It's not the case? Honestly, the story is not believable. If you have been following Yoko, Yoko is one institution which in the past has even been quick at investigating uh, offenses which fall outside their mandate. But now, what falls squarely within their mandate, they are even refusing to investigate. So I think if Parliament calls them, we would like to know whether it is because of the President's prophecy, which says that at the end of the investigations, uh, Honorable Cecilia Abnadapa, his her integrity or her reputation will be res fully restored. Or is because section one, subsection three, provides that in the course of investigating money laundry offense, if the person being investigated has in his or her possession property which the person cannot account for, 
and cannot be reasonably attributed to his or her source of income, then the person is guilty of money laundering. Mm. Or it is both. We don't know. In fact, we want to get the story behind the story of Honorable Cecilia Abinadapa and the main reasons why Yoko should refuse to do mm. uh, the investigation. So, so the, the argument is that Yoko had more than enough basis to even proceed with some investigation into this Cecilia Dapa cash saga. Is it not? Exactly. If you recall, let me give you two instances. If you recall, when I was in office, a frivolous allegation was made against me for breaches in procurement processes. And whereas, whereas it did not fall within the mandate of Yoko, they took it upon themselves to investigate. I have to go to the court and use the high court to stop them. That judgment is available. Auditor General versus Yoko. So it took a high court to stop them, to say that they are acting illegally. So they should stop before they stop. Recently, Professor Stephen Ade made some allegations against, I think, the road ministry. And corruption does not fall within the mandate of Yoko. They quickly went in and investigated and told us at the end that they have cleared the root ministry. So why, what will stop them from investigating an offense which rather falls squarely within their mandate? It gives us a cause to worry. I see. Man, that particular cause of worry is what now um, must lead you to petition the, the parliament to set up this bipartisan probe into the Sicilia the Park cash saga. But beyond that, what are the other options that you will be exploring? Is it just limited to this probe? Yes. So uh, uh, we are in discussion with our lawyers. If there's the need or there are other avenues, we will seek redress through all those avenues. Thank you. I see. But then again, there's a particular concern that I see here. The Attorney General saying in his advisory, which I'm sure you have a copy of and you saw it, that Yoko, you know what? Don't 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 waste your time going to investigate any money laundering case involving Cecilia Adapa, the former sanitation minister. And that's quite clear over there about money laundering. So in this instance, where do you want this probe to focus? What's it about? That's what I'm I'm saying. That if there are other avenues such as legal action, we will not hesitate going for it. In, 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 that's, and and in, in beyond that avenue, should Parliament also be focusing on that particular aspect of establishing whether there's a case of money laundering or not? I think that is an opinion of the Attorney General. And uh, what do you expect of him, his colleague, uh, Cabinet Minister, involved in this? And you think Attorney General would like to prosecute or investigate his, his colleague? So maybe that is why. We are not saying that there is something untoward about Cecilia Dapa. But we want to know the story behind the story, especially the quantum of resources or money found in her possession. We think that he, he owes the public a responsibility or duty to let us know it. If you look at Clause 4 of Article 286, it requires that if you declare your assets and after the first declaration, Subsequently, your declaration or the assets in your possession do not match with the first declaration and your known sources of income, gift or whatever, then those assets have been acquired unconstitutionally. And again, I told you also about the Money Laundering Act. So we want to be sure that it is none of those. And I think we shall all be home and dry if our doubts are cleared. But, but you're, you're petitioning Parliament, this 8th Parliament, hoping that a different outcome would, would be established in this Cecilia Dapa case. Now, bearing in mind that this is this eighth parliament, even though it's, it's a hung parliament, it's, a, it's proven to be a very partisan parliament, where even though it is ha a hung parliament, we've seen instances where even a bipartisan probe has been established. I mean, you look at what happened in the case of the, the former finance minister, Ken Foriata, and, and so on, and, and what happened. Does that concern you that the bipartisan nature of this hung parliament may not help you to achieve that objective of having parliament probe this matter even in the first place. Uh, thank you very much. Many people have raised those observations, but I think 
our civil responsibility is to take the issue to Parliament. It is now, it lies on Parliament to discharge their duties as they deem it fit. If they decide to do it in a partisan manner, fine. If they want to do it in a bipartisan manner, fine. If they put the interest of Ghana first, we will be very grateful. Thank you. I see. But do you see any real appetite? The appetite to pursue this matter and establish, for instance, the basic question of the source of these monies that were identified with Cecilia Dapa in her home, the ones that were stolen and so on. Just that fundamental question. Do you see that appetite to even help establish the answer to it? I don't really think so. Remember, I told you earlier on that when even the investigation had not just started, the president prophesied that he would be exonerated. And these institutions are all under the presidency. So uh, it is not a surprise that they are not willing or they don't have, seem to have the appetite of doing the investigation. Same. And uh, we'll, we'll see how uh, this bipartisan probe that you're asking Parliament to institute plays out. But I, I do appreciate your time, Daniel Yardemelovo. You are so running to another meeting. A former Auditor General of the Republic of Ghana, Daniel Yardemelovo, is part of over 100 individuals, Ghanaian citizens, who are seeking parliament, in fact, petition the Speaker of Parliament to establish a bipartisan probe into the Cecilia Dapa matter. We'll see how things play out on this one here on Ghana tonight. But coming up next, the impact of Ghana's energy sector woes on livelihoods could be damn than you can imagine because even the World Bank has taken notice of the devastation of Dumso and its impact on businesses and social lives in Ghana. And look, we, we're not going to look beyond our individual lives, you know, because we are all living examples of how this erratic power outage is impacting on our lives individually and on, on our businesses as well in many, many ways. Now, the World Bank has observed that Ghanaian businesses and individuals make have issues. In fact, the businesses may collapse if government increases issues with tariffs to address financial issues in the power sector. Recall that there's been suggestions that tariffs should be increased as a way of you know, dealing with these power sector issues. Now, this is part of an overall assessment of Ghana's energy sector, which the World Bank finds to be facing a mirage of challenges. Now, coincidentally, the report comes at a time citizens continue to grapple with power outages. I'm going to show you highlights of this May 2024 report on the country's energy sector, as you see there. The causes for this power crisis the World Bank has diagnosed, which we, we're living right now in it, shortfall in energy sector finances, low revenue collection rate, below cost tariffs, system losses, gas supply challenges. I'm sure that when this matter of even increasing tariffs comes up, you're asking yourself what the, what the power you're paying for, if you're actually enjoying it. The impact, according to the World Bank, is that the reliance on alternative power supply systems, and says a number of us are now relying on candles, flashlights, lanterns, inverters, generators. And this is a diagnosis of the power sector problems over a number of years right from 2012 to now, and the situation is just replaying itself almost the same way. Caution, that's the hike in tariffs could cause businesses to lay off workers. That is the World Bank's caution. Don't consider even increasing tariffs any further. The recommendation is that there should be upgrade of transmission lines improve revenue collection, reduce system losses as well. These are issues that many, many um, energy aspects and, and also other persons have been talking about over the period and hoping that there's been going to be some responses to it to be able to ensure that at least we have a solution to this matter. And this is one thing that is not coming at a time when even the businesses don't know about it. We've been showing you continuously over the period a number of you who are business owners who have had to resort to other means of staying in business 
and even the generators that you're having to use to power your lights to stay in business, the fuel to power these generators have also gone up in price. So the cost of doing business is increasing on a daily basis. Dr. Mark Bedwa Boaji is Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He is uh, going to be connecting with us shortly on Zoom for a conversation on this matter. Some of you have also been sharing your doomsday situation with us. We'll go on, on social media shortly and to get some of your comments that you've been sharing with us here on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and uh, also on X and then get to hear from you and the very many of you who have been sharing your thoughts with us on this matter. We'll connect with Dr. Mark Bedua about just shortly, but this is the observation of the World Bank on this and the, the, the many aspects that they have also talked about on this matter. We'll get to him, but let's go straight into the issues of the city and the, and, and the dollar relationship coming up next here on Ghana tonight and matters are rising right now. We'll tell you, the Ghana city continues to crumble with no end in sight, uh, putting a strain on businesses and individuals alike. We ask what can be done to rescue the city from its continuous depreciation. We have a conversation tonight. Well, guess what? Situation not looking too good for the city. This week, for well, the last one week at least, there's been this widespread concern about the depreciation of the city in recent times. The minority in parliament, Guta, other well-meaning Ghanaians have impressed upon government to take steps to arrest the city. But it remains to be seen what the government is doing. As of May 16, the this dollar was equivalent to 14 cities, 60 pesos. And then in some cases, 14 cities, 80 pesos. And there's been continuous increase in demand for the dollar so much that in other places that we visited, some, some forest bureaus are even looking up to 15 Ghana cities. I want you to take a look at this, right? It gives you a certain, a certain trend. And this week when we went to the forex bureaus, one of the operators gave us an idea of what's been happening to the city over the period. Take a look. The rate is not going down. It's just going up. We don't know what's going on. The Bank of Ghana rate is usually a little bit lower than our rates. I think that's the rate they used to trade between the banks. <laughs> but for us, it's, our rates are always higher. Usually, when you compare our buying and selling rates to the Bank of Ghana, sometimes even our buying rate is higher than their selling rates. We have a conversation, Professor Peter Korte and also Mark Bedwa Baji will both be joining me on this matter because this issue affects businesses directly and individuals as well. Because when the city is falling, it impacts on our lives in many, many ways. Professor Peter Korte is the director of the Institute for Social, Social and Economic Research is at the University of Ghana, Legon. Professor Korte, appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us on Ghana tonight. First of all, what's your own diagnosis of what's been contributing to this continuous depreciation of the city as we're seeing? Well, I, I would uh, cite speculation first. Uh, I think when um, speculation is right, especially in an election year, um, people speculate a lot um, and, and there's a lot of political statements, uh, campaign messages, you know, all, all those things force uh, people's expectations and anticipations and creates some sort of uncertainty. So that, that is uh, one, uh, the speculation is number one. Then number two, in the first half of the year, so the first quarter uh, into the second quarter, there's a lot of demand for forex because businesses have made profits and they want to repatriate their profits. That also creates uh, uh, the demand pressure that is, that is explaining that explains some of the uh, changes we are uh, seeing uh, currently on our, on our markets. Then you know, for our currency, we have also depended on donor inflows quite a lot. So every now and then, when there is cocoa syndicated loan or some donor has disbursed money, like the IMF, World Bank, some bilateral donor has disbursed money, that goes to cushion the forest and then reduces the pressure. Unfortunately for us, 
maybe IMF money has, you know, the tranche hasn't hit the account. And then uh, because of the debt exchange and all the negotiations, we are not getting a lot of inflows. And, and, and also, given how much we are borrowed, we are hit the threshold, and therefore we are not getting a lot of donor inflows. So again, that is also fueling the exchange rate movement. And, and lastly, um, people are, I mean, uh, related to my earlier points about speculation, people are keeping the dollar as a store of value. In an election year, there's uh, quite a bit of uncertainty. So instead of holding on to the, uh, the, the local currency, um, people are using the dollar as a store of value. Uh, so that's, that's a factor. And let's also not forget, we import too much. We tend to import too many things. So that adds to the pressure on the forest. If we are to produce locally a lot of the things we import, that will ease up the pressure. But otherwise, uh, if we continue to import at this level or this much, then uh, we would have demand pressures that our supply cannot meet. It's a very important point you make about people hoarding the dollar or, in fact, buying dollars as a store of value. Right, and and that's the point that the minority makes uh, yesterday as well. And and Professor Pitakoti said with me, Mark Baduabaji is the chief executive officer of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He's also joining us on Zoom for conversation on this. So, Baji, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Alfred. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Now, for you and your 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 members, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. How it, is this continuous depreciation of the city impacting on your business? The reality of the situation, tell me. It, it is, it's very devastating for businesses at this time. And usually, even in an election year, you see that the city will not be depreciating by 16%. But just within this five months, we've seen uh, about 17.7% depreciating, uh, the city depreciating. And of course, our economy, even though it's very small, is well integrated into the international market. As uh, Prof. Riley said, we import almost everything, both finished goods, uh, raw materials, and machines. Most of the machines that are being used by almost all the manufacturing companies are imported. Some import their raw materials. So anytime the city depreciates, its impact on every business is, 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 is very bad. So um, either you are losing your capital, or you are not able to pay back a loan that you have taken in, in, in dollars, or people that have given you their goods you have imported from them, you have to pay back, you are not able to pay. And of course, for every business, um, credibility and confidence is key. So once you are not able to pay some of these loans, then next time it will be extremely difficult for anybody uh, to give you the product to sell or to give you a machine. So, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not a good time at all for any business and I've seen people complaining that prices of goods and services are going up. And it's obvious that the only way for any business to offset this um, negative impact of depreciation is for you to at least increase your, 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 your price a bit just to cover up for uh, the cost you are incurring for the city, city depreciating. But businesses, the rate at which the city is depreciating, the rate at which the cost of production is going up, they cannot transfer this uh, cost to uh, uh, consumers. So if they are to even be able to transfer even just 80 to 90 percent, the price that we are seeing now may be far higher than, than what is in the market. So I think the earlier we do something about it, the better. We, we, we are not happy with what is going on. We have expressed concern, but uh, nothing seems to be done. I don't know whether we have limited option, policy options to be able to resolve uh, the issues. Prof numerated a number of things that are, for me, are causing the depreciation. And some may be short term, others may be long term. The immediate one is what we have to resolve. I mean, as part of the IMF um, uh, conditionalities, the central bank is supposed to build reserve. And it's in the difficulties that we are going through, they are not able to uh, supply the foreign exchange because they have signed an agreement to, to, to build reserve. The other bit also has to do with the government trying to pay for the uh, the IPPs. And uh, that is the only way. Otherwise, we also have uh, found ourselves in the doom. So 
uh, that we are we are we are we are experiencing now. So for me, uh, and as you said, the city basically has lost one of its key functions as a store of value. So anybody who has uh, a city and think that within the next few months uh, the city would depreciate, would want to store uh, its um, uh, major trading currencies. So rational human beings, rational producers are storing their value in the form of these uh, currencies, and it's rather also fueling the, the, the depreciation of the city. So I, I think it's a difficult situation. It may be short term, but if you are not careful, by the time uh, we are out of this uh, rapid depreciation, most businesses will either collapse or they will run at a loss. And, and that's the reality that you're faced with. It's a reality check that if nothing yes. is done immediately, by, by the time, whatever time we get out of this, most of the businesses we have in this country would collapse. And that means that that's going to lead to more people being laid off, obviously losing their jobs if they, these businesses collapse. And, and, and that's where the concern is, Professor Peter Korte. And we're, we're just going to put a bar graph on the screen right now. It shows the average continuous depreciation of the city from the beginning of the year, January to date. Take a look at this. In January, the city was trading at 12 cities, 30 pesos to the dollar. Then in February, 12 cities, 60 pesos to the dollar. In March, 13 cities, 20 pesos to the dollar. Then in April, 13 cities, 70 pesos to the dollar. Now, at least on the average, we're seeing between 14 cities, 50 pesos to, in some cases, 15 cities to the dollar, as we speak. Professor Peter Corte, I mean, you were expected that the, for instance, the IMF second tranche, the $600 million that came in on the 23rd of, of January this year, plus the World Bank money that's coming already, $300 million, and then also the syndicate, and all of these would have at least strengthened or helped the city gain some sustainability against the dollar over this period. But that injection of the dollar with, from all of these sources did not lead to at least a sustained strength of the city. Why is that? Yeah, it, it, it did to some extent. You, you, I mean, if you look at the past month or so, uh, the depreciation has been uh, relatively ma managed. Uh, but then, I mean, as I said, it's a continuous flow, demand and supply. So. Uh, once we exhaust what is in um, and there's no new money is coming in, uh, given the high demand pressure, it certainly will lead to some upward movement. And you see, this year is different compared to previous the previous year. This year is an election year, so there's a lot of uncertainty on people's minds. And, and therefore, the, the, instead of trading the foreign currency, some will hold onto what they have, or we even buy and store, uh, for instance, uh, the dollar, as, keep it as a store value. So all of this come to play in explaining, explaining the uh, turbulence we're seeing. But I, I, I think in the next uh, couple of uh, weeks, once the IMF money flows in and uh, we are able to conclude on the um, negotiations, I, um, I believe there will be some sanity or stability in the system. Of course, with Bank of Ghana's support, given the way they manage the supply and the system. I, I, I say, but Mr. Makobejo, but you're talking about the beyond the long-term measures, medium to long-term measures, Professor Peter Corte talks about. Something needs to be done immediately to rescue the city. What, what should be done? I mean, you're the businesses. You're neck deep into the impact of this city depreciation. What should be done? Well, I, I think Prof has um, given us the solution, the immediate solution, because we, for the for the short term, we don't have any um, uh, anything to do than to wait and and, and expect those monies that are, are is coming from the World Bank and the IMF uh, uh, to flow in. If you if you look at the the previous year, where we were getting these foreign reserves, actually didn't do well. Obviously, the cocoa 
uh, money that we were expecting uh, didn't come in as we, as we usually do. That goes a long way to improve our reserves. So if there are shortages, the, the central bank can just uh, pump in a bit of money to stabilize the situation. So now we, we, we patiently have to wait uh, till such money is coming. But whilst we are doing that, we also have to encourage or plead with those who are uh, buying the, the dollar that they don't need immediately, and they are storing, to also consider the overall impact of what they are doing on the economy, even though they may gain as individuals or as businesses. But the overall impact is, is, is not good. It's very devastating for all of us. So if you don't need the money immediately, uh, we will ask that you you don't buy it. And those who have, I mean, keeping monies in their boxes and also in their houses, those monies are not within the financial system. So they are not uh, increasing the supply of uh, foreign currency in the economy. So people need the money. But others have it under their beds, in their boxes, and they are not um, circulating. So they will not get it even to buy, uh, to, to reduce the pressure on the city. So immediately, this is what, what we have to do. I don't know, um, with the independent power producers, and now they are also on the neck of the government to also be able to pay them their money that we have not paid for a long time. And those monies are very huge. And per the conversation that we've had, if they don't pay, it means that we are all not going to get electricity. So they are also on the on the on the government. So I think we should get a fine balance looking at the total impact of this uh, depreciation on the on the currency. I agree that we are not um, exporting more, but if you look at data in recent times, you realize that our um, trade balance is in surplus which means that we are doing well in terms of uh, the trade balance. What the issue is that most of the companies that are exporting are foreign-owned companies. So they export, they get a dollar, but they retain the dollar in wherever, in their, in their foreign countries. So we don't get a dollar here. So in the books, you see that we have a positive trade balance, but we don't get a dollar. But other thing that we have to do is look at is the other part of the current account largely because of remittances and money that we are transferring because we have borrowed mm. uh, huge sums of money. Uh, so uh, immediately these are, for me, the suggestions that we, we have to uh, work on it. But in the long run, we have to change the structure of the economy. We've said right. this for the past uh, 50 years ago. We, we keep on saying it day in, day out. We come back to it only when we see the city depreciated and we say that, that we should export more. But we have to start from somewhere. And that is the time. Now, otherwise, this perennial depreciation of the city will always recur and then it will come back to, to hunt all of us. Mm. And even beyond this depreciation of the city impact, that is also having a devastating effect on new businesses. Give, give me an idea of how many businesses are collapsing right now. Because you say that if nothing is done immediately, we may end up having loads of you, the, your members and businesses collapsing in the end. Then people will have to go home. Yes, of course, because as I said, most of the business that are in Ghana, they import their own material, or their machines or whatever they are doing. Mm -hmm. Today, we heard that the cement prices are going up and sure. the response from uh, the producers are that they import their raw materials. So they have to increase price. So if you are forcing them not to increase price, then obviously, if they maintain the price, they will, they will collapse. So those who are, are importing, others have taken loans, dollar denominated loans. This is the time for them to pay for the loans. And you have to now get more CD to be able to pay for the loan. At the beginning of the year, just for the sake of argument, if you need $1,000, uh, you need just close to 11,000 Ghana CDs to be able to buy $1,000. Now, as at today, when I checked, it's the, 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 the $1 is to 15 CDs. So the same thousand dollars, nothing has changed. The same thousand dollars that you need to be able to either import something or pay for the loan that you have taken, you need fifteen thousand Ghana cities. Now the economy in itself is, is is struggling. People are not buying the goods that are being produced because of inflation. Purchasing power had gone down. Inflation in itself is a tax, and there are a whole lot of taxes that businesses are grappling with. So the businesses are not making the profit. They are not making the money. Now, when they want to pay the loans, they need more CD 
to be able to pay the same amount of dollar denominated loan that they have to pay. If they want to import, they need more CD to be able to do that. So most of the businesses that are, uh, are largely importing are, are, are not doing well. And as I said, you cannot transfer 100% of your cost of production to the consumer. They don't even have the money to buy. So either you balance it, you are waiting for them to be able to purchase. So a bit of it, and then also looking at the elasticity of that particular product, you tend to send some of the costs to uh, uh, to consumers. So it, on, on the whole, most of the business that have dollar-related issues, and even the local ones that we have, right. they have to buy for those who are importing. And once the prices go up, they need more cities to be able to do that. So it's, it, it cut across almost everybody is suffering. And then the consumers are also suffering. Absolutely. You go to the market today, somebody went, um, a member uh, um, was importing something, and then they gave the dollar uh, at, at 13, actually. And he said he's going, he's going to look for money and come back. Within three days, when he went, the dollar was 15. And he has to look out for the difference between the 13, 13 and, the and the 15. 15. You may look at it as just two cities, but in terms of the, the quantum of how much you are the supposed quantum, to yes. pay, it's a huge money that you are paying. And the True. person came, he wasn't having the money. Now he cannot pay uh, and, and get the product. So the product is still with the person who is, who is buying it for. He has to sell it for him to also to make money. He, he cannot get the product. So it's, it's a very complex uh, situation. But um, even though uh, it's difficult, I don't think it's hopeless. Uh, let's wait presently and see whether we will still get the IMF money. And even that money, even though it's 360 million together with over 200 million um, um, dollars from IMF, I, I don't think it's also sufficient even to solve the problem that we are having. Absolutely. So I think the, the a, a number of um, um, uh, policies and programs should be put together to ensure that we, we, we resolve this particular uh, situation. If, if not, then getting to the end of the year, if things yeah. should continue the way they are, then we should expect the city to be around 18 to 20 cities, and that may likely have a very harmful impact on, on, on businesses and the entire economy. And I want to thank you so much for, for sharing the realities that businesses are faced with. And uh, we do share in this plight that we are going through as consumers. Because in the end, if you increase your prices, we, we can't even buy. Because the purchasing power is not there. Anyway, but thank you. Thank you so much. Mark Bedua Baje is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Coming up next on Ghana Tonight, we gauge the public trust in the Electoral Commission of Ghana ahead of the 2024 general elections. We're going to show you a survey and also speak to election watchers on what the commission can do to improve on public confidence going into the election some seven months away. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. As your election command centre, we're building up to the 2024 presidential and parliamentary election strongly. And our focus tonight is public trust in the Electoral Commission of Ghana. We asked you to join us on social media. And if you've been monitoring Ghana Tonight, we start the conversation three hours before the show begins on Facebook on X as well, X spaces. So do you have any reason why you cannot trust the Electoral Commission to deliver a credible election? That's the question that we asked. A number of you shared your thoughts with us. Now, we're going to come to your comments later, but here's an Afrobarometer survey tracking public trust in the Electoral Commission over a period of time. The Afrobarometer survey is uh, conducted by the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, and if you do the, the computation and also if taking one after the other over the last at least nine rounds of Afrobarometer surveys, this is what we found. And the Democracy Project also put out the selective analysis of it. We're going to show it to you shortly. Dr. John Osayakwapone is going to be joining us on Zoom for a quick conversation on this matter. And we'll show you what the the outcome of this Afrobarometer survey, the cumulative 
results over the last nine rounds looks like. Dr. John Osai Kwapom, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, as we're seeing with, with this survey over the period, what's the, what's the message in there, Dr. Kwapom? Yeah, thank you, Alfred. So if you look at the tracker, uh, which looks at Afrobarometer over nine rounds, going all the way back to 1999. Um, there, there are three key things that you would notice from the tracker. One, um, that the partisan gaps in trust in the Electoral Commission is nothing new. Um, it just that over time, it looks like it has intensified. So one, the phenomenon is nothing new. Two, what the tracker is also showing is that when um, when a voter's preferred political party is in power, they tend to trust the Electoral Commission a lot more than when their preferred political party uh, is in opposition. So that's why you also see in the tracker that, for example, in survey rounds uh, 2020, 2002 or 2005, for example, you see those who identify themselves um, as MPP um, tr having a lot more trust in the Electoral Commission than um, those who identify themselves as NDC. If you flip it and you look at, um, let's say, survey round 2014 or 2012, you would see that voters who identify themselves as NDC have slightly more trust in the Electoral Commission than those who identify themselves as uh, NPP. So that's the second observation, right, that in power, partisans tend to trust um, the EC a lot more than um, you know uh, when they are in opposition in terms of their voters and their supporters. And then the last key point is that if you look at the most recent round in 2022, you will then notice that we are going into an election where voters who identify themselves more with the ruling party have more trust in the Electoral Commission than those who identify themselves with Ghana's main opposition party. So those are the three key um, observations from the tracker that I uh, I just developed based on data from the Afrobarometer survey. Data from the Afrobarometer survey. Let's put that back on the screen. Now, it tracks what happened at least from 2014, 2017, 2019, 2022. Let's go back in, in, into time and, and flip to the next. You see that at least in, in 2014, based on this, you asked the question, trust for the Electoral Commission, 62% of the respondents in 2014 said they trust the Electoral Commission. In that period, the NDC was in power. You, 18% of persons, NPP partisan respondents said they, they trust the Electoral Commission. Fast forward to 2017, 57% of the NDC respondents, 56%. What's the message in there? Because, I mean, after 2016, NDC lost the election. But you see at, at least 57% of the respondents, even more than the MPP respondents, saying that they trust the Electoral Commission. What's the catch in there? So what you notice is that, so for the first six rounds, it's all the Afarijan era. So why, the reason you would see that extreme low percent in 2014 for those who identify themselves with MPP, if you think back, this was coming at the back of the 2012 election. Um, and, you know, a year of the election petition, some of the challenges that were observed with the, with, with the voting processes, um, some of the questions that it sort of the televised, um, the, the, the televised uh, petition sort of raised uh, or at least exposed to us about some of the EC's processes. Um, but also the fact that um, the MPP disputed the 2012 election. So it comes at no surprise that in 2014, Afarijan was still around and therefore trust in the EC for them uh, was uh, was was that very low? So that's that's what explains that twenty uh, that twenty fourteen gap. But the other interesting thing is, if you look at twenty seventeen, 
um, which was the Madame Charlotte Osse era. You mm -hmm. notice that there is no, yeah. um, there's really no difference between the two sets of partisans when it comes to their level of trust in mm -hmm. the EC. That's the only exception, right? That right. it's just like a one point difference. So it really makes no difference. And I suspect that part of that is, in hindsight, the way the 2016 election went, its outcome. Right. And, and that's exactly what it points to. And I want to say thank you very much. And this is one that we're doing um, the survey over the next three to four days, gauging public trust for the electoral commission. So we'll be engaging a lot more as we go on. Thank you so much for joining us here. Dr. Jonas Aikopong is the uh, Center for Democratic Development Fellow in Democracy and Development, also is the director of the Democracy Project. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, we do appreciate your company. There's more news on 3news.com. My name is Alfred Okonse. Have a good night.